G'day guys, Dane here from Clarkie's NRL Column. Welcome back to the YouTube channel. Today, Oliver and myself will be covering our full Dally M 2019 predictions. Oliver, how are you this afternoon? I'm doing quite well, yourself? Pretty good. All right, before we start, guys, got to show you guys some of the recent collections. Now, I have got some pretty cool footwear. Now, you're probably thinking, Dane, you have $1,000 Gucci shoes. What sort of upgrade are we looking at here? Well, let me show you guys. We are looking at Malachi with Tenny Zelezniak signed football boots. We are looking at New Zealand captain Dallin with Tenny Zelezniak signed football boots. And we are looking at two pairs of Isan Masters game worn football boots. On top of that, I'm sure you guys saw my Instagram story. We went to the West Tigers, give a little bit of an insight as to what they're up to this preseason. And we have a 2019 official jersey signed up by the boys on top of that the list keeps going oliver how good is this the 2019 premiers Ooh. a nice little bit of woodwork obviously that topic is up for debate but i'm sure there'd be no arguments from yourself oliver uh gotta say i agree with that one i love it as you know as both uh both me and oliver are big titans fans so that's not why you clicked on this video today guys you clicked on for our 2019 dalian predictions so let's start it off. Straight away, the Dally M winner. I'm predicting James Tedesco. I've gone with James Tedesco because I have spoken about this previously, but there is no more sort of adjustment period for Teddy. He did come from the Tigers system to the Rooster system um, from 2018. And we did see Teddy not necessarily struggle, but he wasn't at his best to start the year. Now he's fully adjusted to the Roosters' lifestyle. There'll be no sort of adjustment phase for him. I see him hitting the ground one, uh, running, and I'm predicting Teddy to take out the Dally M in 2019. Over to you, Oliver, for your uh, selection. Yeah, I've gone with Damien Cook, the man who I personally thought should have got it last year. Had a breakout season in 2018, um, and he's, he's looking to build on that in 2019. Obviously, just signed a monster contract, and he's looking to prove his worth. And I think he sort of will. Um, he's he's now being coached by arguably the greatest coach of all time, Wayne Bennett, which is a scary prospect. And um, I just want to take it back. I know I have before to this one game in 2018, um, just to sort of show the magnitude of how other players, I guess, sort of see Damien Cook as well. South Sydney Rabbitohs versus Melbourne Storm. I think the score ended up about 30 to 26. Rabbitohs winning. It was a nail-biter, as you thought it would be. Um, but each time the Rabbitohs had the ball, Cameron Smith would make sure he was the first marker in defence because when the play of the ball was happening, his eyes, you can notice, were glued on Damien Cook. He was watching Damien Cook's every move because he saw him as that big of a threat. Then what happened as soon as Damien Cook um, decided to not pass the ball and decided to go for a run, it was when Cameron Smith had his had his head turned for a split second. Damien Cook noticed that and he was gone and made about 30 metres and I think later in that set, South Sydney might have scored. So the reason I bring that up is is because Cameron Smith, who most of us would say is the greatest player in the game today, mm -hmm. you know, for him to you know focus that much on one player to see one player as that much of a threat, a threat to maybe sort of his legacy, because I'm sure Cameron Smith probably thought, oh yeah, I'd, I'm going to be maybe the greatest hooker of all time, at least in this generation. And, you know, when I retire, there'll be no one that'll be able to top me for a while. But may maybe he's sort of thinking in, in his head, oh, oh, crap, you know, there's someone someone who is, um, you know, making headlines for positive reasons, which is not what we see as much in the NRL these days, unfortunately. But um, Damien Cook is definitely an example of that. I think he'll build in 2019. As I said, new coaching, Wayne Bennett, I think South Sydney will remain strong. Um, he's got good halves to get the ball to, to create plays. He's got good props if he just wants to cut out the middleman, I guess you could say. And he's great at setting up plays. He's also great at ma making meters, starting out a dummy half, like I said, in that Melbourne Storm game. If he continues that in 2019, I think he gets the Dalian medal because arguably for me, he should have got it in 2018. But I think he had a bit of a slow start to the season, as South Sydney did as a whole. So I don't think he was recognised as much. However, as the season progressed, he really um, started to pick up. And, you know, I think with a full season of consistency, which I think he'll have, he will be hard to, uh, to top there. 
Awesome, yeah, certainly a year to remember made his state of origin and um, national debut for the Kangaroos regardless. We'll move on to fullback of the year. Um, obviously, I've got Tedesco here as he's my main choice, and you have Teddy also. I imagine very similarly to the reasons I stated before. Anything you want to add additionally onto that? Um, just one thing. It, it was really hard for me to choose between James Tedesco and Kalen Ponga. Maybe I would have gone with Ponga if we knew for sure that Kalen Ponga was playing fullback this season. However, there are talks in playing the hard. However, I don't think we know quite yet for sure where KP will be playing in 2019. Mm -hmm. So definitely, if we did know that Kalen Ponga was playing at fullback, maybe he just trumps Tedesco for me. But Tedesco is still definitely up there, and it would definitely be a hard one for me to choose regardless. Awesome. We'll move on to Dali M, Wing of the Year. Uh, two different selections here from us. I've gone with Dallin Wateni Zalesniak. I know he is the captain of the Kiwis and he is the fullback for the Kiwis, but I think he's a much better winger than Dylan Edwards is on the wing. And if you want to fit your best 17 in at the Panthers, you have to have Dylan Edwards in there. You're not going to get value from him on the wing, but you know you're going to get value from Wateni Zalesniak on the wing. I just think with all his experience at fullback now, his dynamic kick returns... I think that incoming coach um, will give him a little bit more of a license. I think Ivan Cleary will say, look, you are the wing, but I'm happy for you to float into the middle and float into the other side for the back line um, in particular set plays, which I think adds a real new element to the Penrith attack. Um, regardless whether he is given that license or not, what Tenny Zolesniak has proven over the years, he's one of the best wingers. Um, with his newfound, I suppose, leadership and maturity as the international captain and also skill set that he's, um, you know, really honed in as a fullback. I see him improving even more on the wing and having a great year. So he's my selection for wing of the year. Yeah, Dallin Matini is a definitely a consistent winger as well. Uh, but I've gone with Josh Adokar, who is another, you know, synonymous name with being a good winger. Mm -hmm. um, in 2018, 18 tries, which obviously wasn't as good as his 2017, where I think he might have got 33, tied with Siliasi Vunavalu, which is absolutely insane. Obviously making his New South Wales debut as a part of it, winning New South Wales side in 2018 and looks to cement his role, I guess, as the New South Wales winger for at least the next 10 years, I'd say. Um, I don't think, as we'll get to later, he'll probably be top try scorer again. However, he'll be up there playing, obviously, in a great Melbourne Storm side under Craig Bellamy. We can't say much about the Melbourne Storm side. We know how good they are. Um, I think it'll be more of a consistent season for Josh Adokar, and he'll just have a really good year at the Melbourne Storm. You've got to think as well, you know, players like Cooper Cronk leaving a couple of years ago, uh, Billy Slater retiring now. The Melbourne Storm roster, I guess, is really opening up in terms of players who get recognition um, and, you know, get the props that they deserve. And I think Josh Adokar will be key for the Melbourne Storm in 2019, and that'll be enough to get him the Dalian winger of the year. He's certainly shown how dangerous he is, and we will see the Fox on show before the season starts two weeks from now for the Indigenous All-Stars. We move to our centre of the year. We've both selected men that have moved to new clubs I've gone with Tyrone Peachy because I feel Peachy has been moved around to so many different positions over the last few years. I think this is his first genuine chance to lock down a position as his own. And I think someone with the talent of Peachy and the potential, I think he takes that opportunity with both hands and really has a, a, an amazing season for us at the Titans. Certainly, I'm hoping so. Um, further to that, now, this is no fault of his own, but I do believe he will lose the jumper he is wearing above my head, the State of Origin jumper. With Luke Keary having debuted for Australia now, I think it's almost impossible to leave him out of that squad for the Blues. So I think he may steal Peachy's 14 jersey. Certainly doesn't have as much versatility as Peachy, but just the fact that he has played for Australia now, it does make it a, a very, very hard to deny him that position in the Blues squad. And I think that's only going to make Tyrone Peachy hungrier to show the Blues selectors what they've missed out on. Uh, I can't speak highly enough of Peachy at this stage in his career, and I think he's really going to have, in some sense of the word, a breakout season for the Titans, where he really cements his position as an NRL centre. Yeah, um, I'm going for a little bit of a more unknown pick, I guess you could say. Uh, Jesse Ramian, not as experienced, definitely. Uh, look, he's already made his ambitions known. He wants to play 
in the centres for New South Wales this year. And, you know, it's someone with the hunger and the potential of Jesse Ramian. Obviously, he's played for the Prime Minister's 13 before, as you can see in the picture mm -hmm. above my head there. Uh, look, I just... I'm really backing this kid. I think he will get um, plenty of game time at the Newcastle Knights. Um, I think he fits well into that system of young players coming into that side um, to really maybe build uh, a fight for a premiership, at least in the next couple of years. And look, if he if he starts out hot in 2019 um, and you know is playing with with form. I don't see any reason why he doesn't get picked in the centres for New South Wales. Obviously, if he's playing well, um, obviously the two centres at the moment are James Roberts and Latrell Mitchell. Arguably, the centre position for New South Wales is the the position with you know the most options, the one where um, it's most likely that we'll see possibly a new centres combination. Maybe if James Roberts isn't playing with the form that he has in recent times, Jesse Raymond could come in there. Uh, and I think he will. I just, going off my ladder predictions as well, I think um, James Roberts might drop off a little bit. We could see a player like Raymond easily come into that side. So I think it's more of a breakout season for him as well. Um, but to the point where he will uh, win the centre of the year, um, it'll be a surprise pick. But, you know, every season we see in the team of the year, surprises get selected mm -hmm. and players who at the start of the season we definitely wouldn't have predicted for... Um, you know, that certain positions player of the year. So I'm trying to keep that in mind as well. And for me, Jesse Ramian isn't that um, that controversial a shout when he's a young player with a lot of potential. He's already made his ambitions known. He's in a great Newcastle Knights squad and he should really be standing out in 2019. Yeah, just on the comment you made there about sometimes we see players selected that surprise us a little bit. You, we've only got to go back to this position in 2018. BJ Leilua, Joseph Leilua selected there. Um, that certainly surprised a lot of people. I know a lot yeah. of people thought Latrell should have been there, but that um, was primarily due to the way um, the Dallium tally vote works. But yeah, you certainly hold a very valid point there. We move to our 5-8 of the year. I've gone with Cameron Munster here. Now, I know he was overlooked for the vice-captain role. The club opted to go with Jesse Bromwich and Dale Finucane, which I have no problems with. Finucane is a workhorse, a leader in the middle, and Jesse Bromwich is the former captain of his country. So I've got no concerns there. But I do feel with Billy Slater's retirement, um, Cameron Munster can bring a further element of leadership to his game. He has made his ambitions known that he does want to be the captain of the Melbourne Storm one day. Certainly, he still has a lot of development in his game to that area. We look back at the grand final when he kicked Joseph Manu in the head and was Sinbin two times, I believe, in a grand final. Yeah. Obviously, we can put them down to brain snaps. That doesn't represent his character or him as a leader, but they're things you, you certainly don't want in your leadership team. Um, so for me, I see Cameron Munster, you know, really rising to a new level, not just in terms of leadership, but in terms of his playing ability um, with the retirement of Billy Slater. There's a big hole left in the Melbourne Storm attack, and I see Cameron Munster filling that. Of course, uh, for 2018, Craig Bellamy did say he has replaced the hole left by Cooper Cronk at our club. Uh, for a coach of Bellamy's magnitude, I can't think of a better comment to receive as a player. I know that's certainly some of the highest accolade you could receive from that coach. Uh, the question mark is, can he replace the hole left by Billy Slater also? I'm tipping yes. Definitely an interesting one there for me. I think it might take a little bit of adjustment period for Cameron Munster. He'll still have the talent on, on field, but more the leadership perspective. So that's why I've gone with someone with sort of a similar story, I guess you could say, to Munster. I've gone with Luke Keary, the current Premiership winning 5'8", and Australian mm. Uh, 5'8". Um, look, I think he'll carry on the momentum that he had in 2018. 2018 was a bit of a slow start for the Roosters as a whole, and a lot of that got blamed on the halves combination with Kiri and Cooper Cronk not clicking. However, they developed some cohesion, and they were brilliant towards the end of the season, towards winning the minor premiership and eventually the premiership. Um, as you said, uh, when you were talking about Tyrone Peachy, you can't really look past... Luke Keary to at least play in the 14 now that he has played for Australia. Mm. Um, I think Maloney's only got a couple of years left at most, and whether he plays Origin or not, those couple of years we don't we don't know. So Keary is definitely the long-term New South Wales 
five eight, I guess you could say. And also, uh, just a f- feeling for me, we know uh, James Maloney has dealt with injuries in the past. Um, I think this year he might, he just might get it. Maybe a long term injury by that, maybe a season ender or something, because his body does seem to be breaking down. So I think Luke Keary would almost be starting alongside Nathan Cleary for New South Wales, I believe. He's already really, I guess, cemented himself alongside Cooper Cronk. Winning the Clive Churchill medal in the grand final, he can play in the big situations. He can be consistent for his club. We can now see. I want to see really what he does on the rep stage as well for New South Wales and for Australia. This is where he really needs to cement himself as not just one of the best club players, but one of the best players in the NRL at 5'8". And I think he'll do that in 2019. I would go with Cameron Munster, Cameron Munster, but as I said, I think he still needs to adjust to that leadership role as well. And that might affect him just a little bit. So I'm going with Kiri here. Certainly a very good choice there with Kiri. Uh, we'll move on to halfback of the year. Uh, this one's a bit of a simple one for me. I've gone with Michael Morgan. I can't forget the 2017 grand final run um, with him in charge of that club. And I can't help but feel the Cowboys, um, if not second to the Panthers, which I see you've got Cleary there. Um, the two halves we've selected, in my opinion, are playing behind the best forward packs in the comp, which does make the selection a little bit easier. I think Michael Morgan has to be hungry after having his 2018 cut short. He is in contention for the number seven jersey for Queensland. Other options available, of course, would potentially be Daly Cherry Evans or Ben Hunt. So he's fighting a battle not only for rep, but, you know, I think he wants to come back and show us all just how good he is, how unfortunate 2018 was for him to get injured. And like I said, playing behind such an explosive and dynamic forward pack led by Tom Alalo and now Josh Maguire, um, two international locks, I see Morgan really thriving off that and playing some footy really similar to what we saw in 2017 where he led his team to the grand final. Definitely a good shout there with Michael Morgan. However, I am going the current New South Wales halfback, Nathan Cleary. He, he's he been very consistent over already his short career. There's not much bad you can say about him. Very talented. We can't even say he's a one-season wonder because he's been doing this for about three years already. Look, his dad's coming into the side to be the new coach, and obviously he wants to be coached by his dad. So we do think it'll be a positive. You never know. It could end up being a negative, but look, right now, we're saying it's a positive that um, Ivan's coming in. As you said, Penrith have got a great forward pack, which Nathan can create great plays for, um, and it's really going to make him look better as well. And let's not forget, this guy is still only 21 years of age. I think I think he's about the same age as you, mm. which, um, which is crazy, and he's already been doing this for about three years. They're already the current New South Wales halfback, and for me, should eventually be the long-term, probably Australian Kangaroos halfback, um, yeah, he, he's still got a bit of improving to do, which is also really scary because he is only 21 years of age and to already be as talented as he is is amazing. I think he only um, skyrockets from here in 2019. Look, you, you think of the other options. Cooper Cronk um, should still have a very solid year. However, might drop back a bit and Keir, Luke Keary might take on a bit more of a prominent role in that senior rooster side, of course, my choice for the 5-8 of the year. Luke Brooks as well, obviously had a breakout year in 2018, was last year's halfback of the year. Um, However, I I think he'll still be consistent, but I don't think he'll reach Nathan Cleary levels in 2019 for me personally. And look, James Maloney being in that Panther side as well, um, you got to think Nathan Cleary maybe in 2019 really takes on um, that number one role in the halves combination if James Maloney is dealing with these injuries. And look, if he does have a season-ending in- injury, which I think he might just because of you know his body breaking down a bit, he's going to have Tyron May or Jerome Luai coming into the halves with him where you know they are young halves as well and he is the more experienced half and he'll definitely be taking on that prominent role um, in that halves combination. Yeah, definitely can't argue with that there. But for those of you that may not know, In some way or another, I hold some, I guess, by blood relation to Nathan Cleary now. Um, My partner's uncle is Nathan Cleary's uncle. So, um, you know, the family tree is all over the shop, but we are on a branch somewhere. And um, Nathan, I'm coming for you. I'm going to take you out before this year's State of Origin series. Um, I'm just kidding, of course, guys. Um, Two prop of the year. 
Um, Nathan Cleary would smash me. Let's just get that on the record before we get the <laughs> keyboard warriors coming in. You're nothing. Cleary would kill you. I agree. Um, if you think Kiri would cl- kill me, leave a thumbs up in the comments. Um, we'll move on to our prop of the year now. We've both gone with Andrew Fafita here. Um, I've gone for Fafita because when we look back to 2018 when the Sharks pack was diminished, Gallon was injured, Lewis was injured, and so was Wade Graham. Fafita was named captain um, for that period, or at least uh, that game there, and he put up some of his best stats that year. I believe he ran for around 200 metres. Now, one game is very different to 25 rounds of action, but Fafita does find himself in a situation where he has previously thrived. Graham is out injured until round 13, and Luke Lewis yeah. is now retired. So Fafita finds himself in a situation where he's performed so well in the past. He's the reigning prop of the year. I expect him to defend that title. Yeah, I'd have to agree there. And just because you added in the little tidbit about your connection with Nathan Cleary, I guess I have sort of a connection to Andrew Fafita as well. I want to add that in. My dad actually works with his mum. So that, that's just <laughs> something I wanted to add in, there which is a bit great. See, everyone's connected somehow. We're all, yeah. we're all related um, under God or something. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, Anyway, just on Andrew Fafita, look, obviously the reigning prop of the year was up there for a lot of the season for um, the Dahlia medal itself, which is crazy for a prop to do in these days. That just shows the talent of Andrew Fafita. Um, Look, I know he cops a lot of flack for some stupid things he sort of does off-field, I guess you could say, but um, let's not let that take away from our sort of idea we have of Andrew Fafita on the field. That doesn't correlate with him off the field. You may call him a grub or whatever for whatever he does off the field, but that shouldn't have any impact of how you feel he does on the field. He's a great player on field, and especially, like you said, Wade Graham is going to be out at the start of the season. Luke Lewis has retired. You know, Paul Gallon, we don't know. He could get knocked out by John Hopalati in a couple of days and career will be over. But, um, mm. you yeah, know, I think for me, Fafita probably takes on that leadership role. I know it's crazy to say in a forward pack with Paul Gallon, but I think he takes on more of a leadership role. I think he's, you know, sort of the figurehead that'll get the boys really pumped up here. He, he's sort of like David Clemmer in the sense where he does have that aggression, but I feel like he can channel it better yeah. and use it a bit more for good. And I feel like that'll really, um, he'll be the, the centerpiece, I guess, for some games where the Cronulla Sharks really need to pull out a victory and he'll, he'll be the one getting them that victory, I believe. Yep, can't argue with that. He's certainly done it in the past, whether it was scoring the try and then instantly pointing to the coaching box or whether we look at the 2016 grand final where, of course, he scored that famous try. Uh, We move to our hooker of the year. Um, You've already said pretty much everything I wanted to say on Damian Cook before. Had a little bit of a slow start. uh, Has a whole season of consistency under his belt. Just signed a monster deal. Australian, New South Wales Blues hooker. Clearly the best hooker in the in the world for me. Oh, sorry, in the game, maybe you could say Cameron Smith is rivaled with that. I would certainly agree with that argument. But we'll go top two hookers in the world. Yeah. Um, so not too much to say there, guys. He's our selection for hooker of the year. Second row of the year. Um, again, we've gone with the same man. I've gone big Billy Kikau because in some facet of, of the word, I would say he was almost robbed in 2018. For me, he was the standout second row of the year, all year. Um, All his performances on the field were pure class. And if we're talking forwards with X Factor, up there with Fafida, I would say Kikiao is definitely top five in the world for forwards with X Factor. He runs such dynamic lines outside um, James Maloney and Nathan Cleary that... I can't see anything, you know, stopping this train. Kikau is going to continue this rise in form and have a great 2019, in my opinion. Yeah, I have to agree with you there, and especially on that X factor point. Look, Penrith have always, at least for probably the fa- past five seasons or so, had a really good forward pack. However, they've really needed someone with that X factor, as you said. Billy Kikau comes in, he has that X factor. He's young as well, and you know, a forward pack with. You know, sort of aging players. For example, obviously Trent Merrin's gone now. Who wasn't aging, aging, but he wasn't too young either. Um, like James Tamo, and of course, um, like the likes of Sam Kendry as well. And losing players such as Leilani Latu, who obviously didn't work out. I guess you could say at the Titans. But um, yeah, Bill Kiko is definitely, I guess, the the figurehead of that forward pack now. I guess you could say for Penrith. Look, there's not too much more I can say. Um, and I can't wait to see him and Nathan Cleary, my other pick for halfback of the year, 
Um, I can't wait to see what their combination has to show for in 2019. Yeah, I agree with what you said there. And you could almost argue he is the spearhead of their attack. By running those outside lines, yeah. he attracts the defenders in, which in turn allows um, Wonga Blake to make the break or yeah. Nathan Cleary to throw the dummy and go himself, etc. We'll move on to our lock of the year. No controversial picks here, guys. You know we've got to go with Jason Tamalalo. I mean, what can we say about him, Oliver? Consistently um, 100, 150 yeah. metres. I don't know what else to say. He's the best lock in the world for me by far. No, but see, I thought, see, I've heard rumours apparently that Jason Tamalolo might be getting pushed into the second row or even the bench so that Josh Maguire can start at a lot. Okay. Second row yeah. I could live with, bench, I, I can almost rule that out. Certainly that won't happen. Yeah. But, um, I, I don't think he moves at all. I think if you're yeah. the best player in the world at a position, you stay at that position yeah. no matter what. I think Josh McGuire goes front row. Would you agree with that? He has previously played there, yeah. so it's not a huge change for him. Yeah, I'd have to agree with that, definitely. Yeah. As in, you make, when, when it's James Tamalolo we're talking about, you do make room. And look, I could possibly even feasibly see Josh Maguire maybe being an impact player off the bench some games as well. I mean... If he did go yeah. to the 14 role, he's also played hooker there for Samoa. So not a very popular choice by any yeah. other word, but it, it could be something Paul Green's looking at. We don't know. One thing we do know, Jason Tamalalo is, if not the best forward in the world, the best lock in the world. Yeah. We move to our bench player of the year. Now, I can understand my... Uh, why my selection here, Victor Radley, may be unpopular. I know a lot of people have him starting at lock for the Roosters. I don't. I have Isaac Liu retaining that spot. And I have Victor Radley moving to the bench. Um, in no way am I suggesting he will have a form drop or there's any um, on-field reason as to why he would be dropped to the bench. But I just love his aggression. And I think his aggression can be better used at the 30-minute mark when a couple other forwards are starting to get a little bit tired and Radley comes out. More importantly, with the interchange set to drop, Radley as a bench player for me is the sort of player that comes on and forces the opposition cha- uh, team to go to his bench also. I just I just think he'll be so yeah. damaging off the bench. And we have to remember he was a hooker coming through the lower grades. He only became a second row last year. Um, so playing him in the number 14 jersey does add a touch of versatility there. I certainly wouldn't be bringing Jake Friend off because he is a defensive workhorse for the full 80, but the option is there. Potentially, you know, the Roosters could be down by 12 points. Robinson could make the call, hey, let's get Friendy off. Let's get Radley into hooker. Rads, I want you scooting out. I want you, you know, sparking our attack, um, which he's certainly capable of doing from what we saw in 2018. All those reasons I just said, I've got him as my bench player of the year. Yeah, for me, I've gone someone different. So, a bit of a smoky, I guess you could say. Um, Payne Haas, young Brisbane Broncos forward. Look, um, as I said, a lot of potential coming off that bench with my Brisbane Broncos sort of lineup. I've gone for a mix of sort of young and old players, especially in that forward pack. And I think when, you know, I th- I'm, yes. I'm just having a little think here about, you know, sort of the Broncos players who might be, you know, starting to feel... A little bit old, I guess you could say. Breakdown maybe a little bit. For those sort of players, I guess maybe Matt, Matt Gillette, he's if he starts having it, if he has a, if he starts dropping off in 2019, um, I think he still starts. But I think Payne Haas comes on maybe a bit before halftime. Maybe, might be the 20-minute interchange, first interchange each game to really get Brisbane pushing Um you know, to really re-energize and reinvigorate the side. You know, if if the forward pack's getting tired, you get this young player with a lot of talent and potential onto the field and you get him really, you know, you know what I mean, like invigorating the side. It's more of a spiritual thing as well. I think when he comes on, he sort of lights a fire under, every, under everyone in that Brisbane Broncos side. So it won't necessarily be his talent that impacts the impacts the game when he comes on but sort of his energy will yeah. sort of reverberate throughout the side oh, i agree with what you're saying his energy is there and his enthusiasm is there you look back to last year when the broncos were losing to the bulldogs in that game he came off the bench and tried to lift the team straight away pain i respect it but you ran straight at david clemmer not the smartest thing um he was obviously concussed as a result but that's yeah. a, sh- a sign of dedication to his enthusiasm and, and energy he's willing to bring from the bench and certainly like you said he is likely to get a lot more minutes especially to start the year because Matulet is returning from some very serious injuries 
I don't think he plays the full 80 to begin with. In yeah. fact, I think it takes up to 10 rounds for him to get the match fitness required to play the full 80. So that's certainly a great selection there off the bench. Now we're going to move away from position of the year, guys. We're going to go to our captain, coach, and rookie of the year. So we'll move on now. Captain of the year, Boyd Cordner. We both have him. Uh, you know, last year, he was the first New South Wales player ever to lead his uh, his club team, his state to a New South Wales, to a sorry state of origin victory, and win a game with the Australian Kangaroos as captain. So he's created a little bit of history last year as a captain. And if our ladder predictions are something to go off, guys, we have the Roosters finishing again as the minor premiers. So I think um, you yeah. know. I've also, as much as I hate to say it, I've got the Blues winning state of origin as well. So that everything's pointing towards for me Boyd Corner being named captain of the year. Yeah. Anything you'd like to add to that? He's the Australian captain. I mean, when when you're the Australian captain as well, there's um there's not not too much argument against him being captain of the year. He's got that role for a reason, you know, a role that for a long time was Cameron Smith's and um I think it was Darren Lockyer's for a bit before that, yep. which is great company to be in. Um and Arguably for me, we know that Greg Inglis was named Australian captain first, but as soon as GI was named captain, I, I sort of thought to myself, why wasn't Boyd Cordner given the captainship? Just because he is younger than GI as well. He's going to be a more long-term captain. Yep. And look, Boyd Cordner's not always the most talented player on the roster that he's on, not taking away from his talent, obviously, but he, he is a good leader. And that, that's what you need to be, captain of the year, a good leader. He proved that in 2018 by being the premiership winning captain with the Roosters, um, proved that by winning Origin with New South Wales um, as captain and, of course, getting that win with Australia. So um, you can't really go past that for me. Like you said, not the flashiest player, but it's the small things Cordner does that inspires his team. Nobody wants to be the forward that takes that hit up when you're on your own 10-metre line, but Cordner's willing to do it every time. And I certainly agree with you. I am a Queenslander, but I, I disagreed with the selection of Greg Inglis over um, Cordner, primarily because, like you said, he is the younger option there. But also, if we're going off state of origin, Cordner captain the winning side, not the losing yeah. side. So a um, bit of a controversial decision there. In the end... Uh, didn't matter anyway as GI uh, blew his chances, unfortunately. We'll move to our coach of the year. Again, we've both got the same man. And again, I'll point to our ladder prediction video, guys, if you're interested in watching that. It is on the YouTube channel. Um, but we've both gone with Nathan Brown. For me, I think this is the year Knights return to top eight footy. I commend Nathan Brown on signing a contract that is completely performance-based. Um, so if you guys are unaware with what that actually means... He can be sacked at any moment without any questions asked. If the board deems him unsuitable, there's no legal repercussions here. There's no payout fees here. It's goodbye, Brownie. You've been deemed not suitable. Um, so I certainly commend him on signing that contract. He is the only coach in NRL history, I believe, to sign that kind of contract. And yeah, with the Knights returning to finals football this year, um, as my prediction, I've got to have him as coach of the year. Yeah, and look, Another reason why we sort of went with Nathan Brown and not the obvious choice of Trent Robinson is throughout the years, the common theme has been the coach of the year hasn't been the coach that wins the minor premiership. Sometimes it is, but not always. It's generally the coach who has improved the most. Yeah. We've seen Anthony Seabold get coach of the year in his first season coaching in 2018. Obviously, the Rabbitohs didn't win the comp, but they weren't minor premiers. So that's just an example of that there. And that's why we've gone with Nathan Brown, both of us, taking a side that was consistently last on the ladder and, you know, this year taking them to a real threat in the finals. And if they do make the finals, he gets coach of the year for me. Um, also, just on that performance-based contract, I think if Newcastle do make the top eight, they upgrade that contract to a proper contract with an end date, with, with a payout. They'd have to. I mean... And it can go one of two ways for Brownie. If Newcastle do play poor, I think this year he probably does get the sack maybe at the end of the year. But, um, you know, if they do make the finals, I do think that contract gets upgraded. And I think it's more likely we will see Newcastle making the finals in 2019. Um, he's been a great recruiter as well. We've yep. seen, you know, David Clements just come through the door this season. Jesse Ramian, who I was talking about before. Uh, and over the past couple of years, we've seen the likes of KP, Kalen Ponga, 
and Mitchell Pierce come into that side. So a great recruiter. You know, he, he seems like he's got the, the locker room on his side as well, which is crucial for any coach. It seems that the boys really love playing for him. It seems like a really good culture in Newcastle. So for me, you can't really go past Nathan Brown. Yeah, certainly uh, just touch on the topic you said about the contract next year. Look, if he does get them to finals football, he's in the driver's seat. You know, yeah. he, he can he can talk money with the Knights. Oh, you want to pay me 400000 Okay, I want five hundred k. Or you can go back to being wooden yeah. spooners for the next however many years. So, you know, it could go one of two ways for Brownie, but we're tipping it goes his favour. Let's move to our Rookie of the Year. I've gone with Adam Kieran, who was... Uh, or he was at the Penrith Panthers, sorry, last year. Um, he was with the Bulldogs before that. I've gone with him because I'm tipping him to replace Sean Johnson, whether that's in the number six or number seven jersey. Now, they have lost a goal kicker in Sean Johnson. Uh, Adam Kieran is a goal kicker, so that's a big plus side for him at the moment. He scored over 200 points for the Penrith Panthers last year in the Intrust Super Premiership competition. Uh, he's a talented playmaker. I, for me, he is leading the race. I know... Chanel Harris Devita is also a great young talent, um, but there's certainly more evidence to suggest Kieran is the better player at this stage, given he scored that many points in reserve grade. A, a lot of people are riding on the back of CHT because of that amazing highlight where he did the scorpion kick in the Junior yeah. Kiwis game. Um, but that's one play, guys. If we want to look at exactly. consistency, let's look at a player that prove, is a proven playmaker to score over 200 points in the next best competition in the world. Yeah, just on Chanel Tavita Harris as, as well, just you know, to give an accolade to him, he was, I believe, the he was either the halfback of the year or he was the Holden Cup player of the year in 2017. So he, he, he does have a little bit of something going for him as well. But I, I, I still do agree with... Uh, Adam Kieran replacing Sean Johnson at the Warriors as well. However, my pick is also a bit of an unknown entity. Well, he's probably a bit better known than Adam Kieran, probably because of the jersey that he's wearing right there, the uh, Prime Minister's 13 jersey. Um, stirred a little bit. I, I keep going to the word controversy. It stirred a little bit of talk when young Corey Allen was selected for the Prime Minister's 13, going from the Bronco system now to South Sydney with Wayne Bennett. Look, um. I say he gets rookie of the year because, yeah, you know, I was a bit unsure a little while ago. However, with GI being out the first few rounds, and look, um, arguably GI and Dane Gagai will be out during Origin season. Corey Allen definitely has the opportunity to cement his place within the South Sydney Rabbitohs squad, and you know, um, players like Dane Gagai, um, Alex Johnston as well. Maybe if he is out of form a bit, and Greg Inglis, obviously another big name. I sort of think it might be seamless. If one of those guys are out, he'll come in, he'll play his role, and he'll do it amazingly. And, you know, he doesn't have to have an amazing, amazing season to be the rookie of the year. However, I think he will have a really good season. And, you know, no rap on us this year or anything, I don't think. I still think he's a, a bit an experience for that, even though he is wearing, um, you know, basically an Australian jersey in the picture above my head. However, a lot of potential, a lot of hype, and I think he will be giving the opportunity to be the Rookie of the Year in 2019. I like that selection. Uh, if you guys are wondering why I'm looking down, I'm just writing a couple notes so I can come back with a couple points of my own. And what you were saying there, Oliver, he is the only player in the Prime Minister's 13 last year that has not played NRL yet. So there's certainly that area of excitement, I suppose you could say. You did touch on Greg Inglis's injuries. Absolutely, I agree. We saw last year how troublesome a hamstring can be um, in terms of Darius Boyd's season. Probably his poorest um, I can think of, you know, when injury came for Queensland, the obvious choice is usually to go with the devil you know rather than the devil you don't. Um, but they didn't go with Darius Boyd, which prompted him to announce his rep retirement. Greg Inglis is having some pretty serious injuries this preseason, yeah. if what we're hearing is correct. He's out for the first one to two rounds. So straight away, the door opens for Corey Allen to leave his mark. And um, and lastly, state of origin. Dane Gagai, Greg Inglis, both obvious selections for the Maroons. Um, so at some stage this year, Allen will get his chance to yeah. shine. We've got two more to touch on now, guys. We've got the top point scorer for the year and the top try scorer. We'll move to point scorer now. I've gone with Jermaine Asako. Now, I'm selecting Jermaine as... I looked to Anthony Seabold's attack in 2018, and wingers were at the focal point of his attack. 
We saw Robert Jennings finish second on the NRL try scoring tally list, only second to David Fusatua from the Warriors, who had an incredible season. So I see him bringing this attack with him to the Broncos. The Broncos obviously have hugely talented wingers in Asako and Corey Oates. I'm predicting Corey Oates will get a couple more tries than Asako, but of course Jermaine Asako is such an accurate goal kicker that uh, for that reason I've got to have him as the top point scorer in 2019. My top point scorer, Nathan Cleary, a man that I've covered before, so I won't talk too much about his on-field talents. Um, you've got to think Penrith will score a few, definitely a few points um, most of their games this season. And look, he is renowned for his goal-kicking ability. I think that will continue. He is a, a master goal-kicker um, at this young age as well. You know, He's someone that in the long term could probably um, trump, I think, it's Hazanel Masri who currently has the record for most points of all time. I think he got that in 09, I think. So it's you know a 10-year standing record. It's not going to get broken by Cleary this year if he does do it. However, I think eventually um, Nathan Cleary, if he keeps going on the way he has been with his goal kicking, um, he's got he's got to trump that eventually. I'd say. And as I said, you know a lot of points will be coming through. Penrith this season, so he will have plenty of opportunities to be kicking goals, game in, game out, and usually he is pretty much on target. Yeah, I would agree with that. The only question mark I have over your selection there is Ivan Cleary at the West Tigers in 2018 coached predominantly defense. Now, it's not by any means certain that he will bring that game plan to the Penrith Panthers, but if he does, we could see the Panthers turn more into a defensive unit like we saw from the Tigers last year. I mean, they versed, what, the yeah. Storm, they versed the Roosters, and they held them to six points or something each. Um, there was a period there where I believe over three games only had 18 points scored against them. So if Cleary yeah. does bring that game style, that could affect Cleary's chances, but um, only a theory. But I will take what I was saying there on Ivan Cleary into our top try scorer. I've gone with Corey Thompson playing outside the very powerful Mahe Fenua. For me, the way Mahe carries that football, I've only seen one player similar, and that's Conrad Hurrell during his time at the New Zealand Warriors. We didn't see it so much at the Titans, but Mahe is just a wrecking ball. He attracts defenders in, and he's got an offload, most importantly. I believe he'll be playing inside Corey Thompson, and I think with Ivan Cleary now gone from the club, Michael Maguire will bring a more fresh attacking approach to the West Tigers in 2019. I was at their training yesterday, and for over two hours in their field session, it was predominantly attack, and it was predominantly fitness, which you can obviously expect at this yeah. stage of preseason. But yeah, I'm tipping Corey Thompson to really thrive in the new environment, well, not the new environment, the new coaching environment. Um, certainly with Mahe Fanua inside him, that doesn't hurt his chances. So he's my tip for top try scorer, 2019. All right. How many tries do you reckon he'll score? What range? You don't need... Yeah. Okay. Range? I'm going to go 20 to 26. I'd like to think he scores almost a try every game outside Mahe. Um, and certainly, you know, there's, there's a layer to their attack with Benji Marshall. Um, they've also got Josh Reynolds... Um, and halfback reigning halfback of the year, Luke Brooks. There's another element to their to their attack. Yeah, I'll go 20 to 26. It's a big okay. call, but I see him scoring almost at least once every game. Well, I'm going with Blake Ferguson, which might be a bit of a surprise because you might be thinking Parramatta shouldn't be scoring too many tries in 2019, right? Especially with me, I've got them finishing 15th. That may be true. They might not score a lot, but if they are going to score, I think those tries will be coming through Blake Ferguson. A great offensive year in 2018, obviously. I think 2019, he sort of builds on that, where he is more of a figurehead, I guess, within that parameter roster. Um, I don't see tries coming through Bevan French, really. I know he might be another option. Even Clint Gutherson, I think he'll be more of a... I think. Gutho will probably be at fullback, but he'll be more of a, you know, I guess a third half. He he has that versatility about him. So I don't really think he is, you know, really one to look at as a running fullback to really try and score tries. I think he'll be sort of more in the ruck and possibly being the player that gets the ball out to Ferguson at times. You know, um, Ferguson's also re reliable. And that's the thing. You've got to think... Um, I don't think he. I don't think he gets a lot of tries, but I think it's still enough to be top try scorer. Just because, as I said, I think 
the majority of Parramatta's tries will be coming through Blake Ferguson in 2019, purely down to that fact. I know we've got some more prolific try scorers, I guess. However, in a side where, you know, you, you really don't have that many players who spring to mind as try scorers, you've at least got one there, which is Blake Ferguson. And I've, I'd say a bit less. You'll probably get between 18 and 20 for me. However, I think across the other teams, we'll see um, the try scoring duties, I guess, sort of spread out um, a bit more evenly. So I think that's why he might just trump it there, but it will be close. Awesome, guys. So we do want to hear your predictions also. That wraps up our predictions, but um, do let us know. What I believe we'll be doing is we'll upload a graphic to both of our Facebooks with this link. Um, so if you've clicked on the link now, obviously you've watched the video. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. It did run for a while. Um, so potentially one you might want to watch in podcast format, putting the phone down, cooking dinner, uh, doing a chore, etc. But yeah, we do want to hear your guys' selections um, on the Facebook post in the comments and we'll certainly do our best to get back to all of you. Uh, my name is Dane from Clarkie's NRL Column. All my social media is splattered all over the screen. I'm sure you can see it, but I'll hand over to Oliver to say goodbye to our viewers at home and I hope you enjoyed this video. Yeah, Oliver from NRL, in my opinion, um, predominantly on Facebook. That's where most of my stuff goes to and where I've got sort of the bigger following. However, if you do have Instagram, I'd love it if you guys could like the Instagram page as well. I'm really starting to push that Instagram page as well and trying to put more focus onto that. Still focusing on the Facebook page and that as well for all, all you guys on the Facebook page. But if you have Instagram, um, go on there, give NRL, in my opinion, a like and like some of the photos and share your opinion. See you later, guys.